Uh, so I just wanted to start by welcoming everyone uh, to the first event for this year's Sociology Colloquium, Colloquium Series, uh, which is sponsored by the Social Science Student Donation Fund. So for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Katie Mendez, and I'm a new faculty member here in sociology. And along with our chair, Howard Ramos, um, I've been helping to organize the seminar series for this year. So even though the talk is online and our speaker is based in the UK, I still wanted to start by welcoming everyone to Western University, which is in London, Ontario. And I wanted to acknowledge that Western is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapuwak, and Attawandaran peoples, whose traditional lands that were gathered upon today. Okay, so I'm really delighted to kick things off today with Dr. Jackie Sanchez Taylor. So Jackie's a senior lecturer in sociology in the Department of Law and Criminology at Royal Holloway, which is part of the University of London. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Taylor for about seven years. Uh, and for about five of those years, we worked together um, in uh, the same school of media communication and sociology at the University of Leicester. So Dr. Taylor has a really fascinating research portfolio. She's published in journals like Sociology, Feminist Theory, and Sociological Review. So just a bit of background about her. Her work has been funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, so the ESRC uh, in the UK. And she's done uh, work on things like people who travel around the world for cosmetic surgery. She's explored patients' experiences of that travel. And she's also looked at the development of cosmetic surgery tourism more generally. She's again won funding from the ESRC to study sex tourism. And this work has, an, has involved exploring the sexual exploitation of children within the tourist context. She's looked at the development of the informal sex industry and she's looked specifically at female sex tourism. So Dr. Taylor has been expert consultant for the European Union and the charity Save the Children on trafficking and the sexual exploitation of women and girls. So it's going to be on this topic of sex tourism that Dr. Taylor is going to speak about today. And her talk is titled Hidden Voices and Anti-Trafficking Discourses, Anti-Trafficking and Sex Work in Jamaica. So Dr. Taylor will have up to 40 minutes to speak and then we'll have the rest of the time open for a QA. and a uh, And I really look forward to hearing what Dr. Taylor is going to say. And with that, um, I'll hand it over to her. Okay, thank you, Caitlin, for inviting me to do this talk at um, Western University and um, to meet all of your colleagues. I'll be really interested in getting some feedback from this project. I'm going to start sharing my slides now. Um, okay, let's just go back to the beginning. Right, so I've entitled this um, talk Hidden Voices in Anti-Trafficking discourse. Sorry, I don't know why it's got sorry there. I think I have my um my dictate open then. And so it's just dictated over some of the slides. So I am sorry about that. Um, and this project um, is really drawing on uh, data that we gathered from a British Academy funded project. Um, so it's like Connell, Julia O'Connell Davidson and Katie Cruz, both at um, Bristol University. And um, we entitled the project Revisiting Child Sex Tourism, Rethinking Business Responses, because Julia and I did research on sex tourism about 20 years ago in different places around the world, so Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Costa Rica, um, Jamaica, Goa, South Africa, and, um, and we were interested, um, this paper kind of, we were interested in applying for funding when we heard that Jamaica had been um, highlighted as a place where there was a lot of child sex tourism, which wasn't something that we found, say, 20 years ago. So, um, and so I wanted to think about how we frame some, uh, say, frame some of the social issues. And, and uh, Kendall and Gibson argue that how we frame social issues profoundly influences our understandings of them and how we think and talk about solutions. And they argue that framing involves more than just naming a social problem, it's about what we choose to say about it and how we say it. So over the last 20 years in the global north, there's been a real um, 
there's been a real kind of focus on trafficking and modern slavery, both of which are said to be widespread and yet invisible, um, in plain sight, but invisible, so hidden, but yet invisible. And the trafficking and modern slavery framing encourages us to think about this problem in terms of crime and sexuality. So it's about sexual exploitation and the suffering of innocent people. And uh, to solve this problem, then they call for better, stronger criminal law, law enforcement, and for victim protection and support. So this frame really focuses on the individuals that are involved in the crimes in order to either punish them or save them as victims. And in the popular imagination, sex work continues to be constructed as a very extreme form of sexual exploitation and not work, even though in lots of places around the world, even in Canada, I think you have legalized aspects of the, of, of the sex industry. Um, and it focuses on um, women's labor then as being uh, very harmful, sexual labor as being very harmful and more dangerous than other forms of, of, of labor. Um, and there's very little uh, engagement with the sex industry and how it works and how people are incorporated into it. Um, and we understand more and more um, every day about how the uh, sex industry works as a form of work, how people use it and enter into it as a form of work. And we also understand that the racialized inequalities and sexualized inequalities also shape global markets as more men and LGBTQ people are integrated into the sex industry. Um, and there's also a really powerful moral panic about trafficking that's linked to children. So even though there's uh, like all of this focus on it, it's really um, rare to hear the voices of those involved in the sex industry and to think about how they frame their involvement. Um, uh, and instead we get the increasing sort of dominant framing of trafficking and modern slavery is kind of um, imposed onto the global South countries. Uh, it's particularly by the US De State Department through the TIP report, which is the Trafficking in Persons report, um, but also the UK um, Modern Slavery Act is being exported to uh, the Caribbean through uh, Commonwealth links um, and, uh, <coughs> and the government's kind of actively promoting this legal framework. So if we think of the TIP report in Jamaica, where our project's based, um, they've been consistently upbraided by the US Department, a state of department uh, in its lack efforts to combat human trafficking. So in 2005, it was put on a tier three listing um, along with North Korea, which really um, threatened to put Jamaica at risk of losing much needed foreign aid through uh, as, as well as kind of reputational damage through, you know, through and losing customers through sort of tourism industry. So since then, Jamaica's really bent over backwards to try and meet the demands of the TIP report, including spending 38 million um, Jamaican dollars on anti-trafficking projects, which range from training police officers and buying a van on which they can drive around their um, traffic victims but yet year after year they're they're still found to be lacking um and um and 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 sort of told off for having a, a poor response uh to to the problem of child sex tourism and trafficking so julia and i were interested to understand like what was going on um and when Jamaica reported that it was, you know, when it was reported in the PIP report that it was, Jamaica was suffering a significant but hidden problem of, of sex tourism and child trafficking. We wanted to know how did it gather the data for this? You know, how, how what, what was actually going on in the ground? So our project wasn't really entering into the numbers game. Instead, we were trying to look at who'd been affected or at risk to falling victims of trafficking. Um, and we conducted, Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, can. Hold on. Yeah, so um, the research involved um, ethnographic field trips to tourist resorts in Jamaica, and specifically Negril, Mo Bay, um, Ocho Rios. Um, and we did conducted biographical narrative interviews, group. Uh, uh, focus groups. Um, we tried to get people to tell us their life stories and how they ended up. Um, we, we interviewed adults who had worked in the sex industry as, ch as children or had some form of work at, um, were working as children or in exploitative or violent situations. We wanted to understand how they fr framed that experience uh, and what they saw as the nature and cause of the problem and what they thought were the uh, solutions to this.
So it's very much a, a mixed method approach. Um, and, and we kind of wanted to sort of think about, you know, how, what could we find that maybe um, other researchers weren't finding? So all of our interviewees grew up and are still living really in the shadow of, of, of Jamaica's long relationship with the IMF. And I think it's important to kind of provide you with some of the background of Jamaica uh, and the context that some, some of the people are making these decisions in. Um, policy packages tied to IMF loans have had a really devastating impact on the poor um, living there um, and the government's capacity to provide them with social protection and social welfare. So Jamaica is a country that has um, a long history of colonialism and slavery and this has also had a real impact on the economic independence and development of the country. So um, the debt repayment at the moment is twice what's spent on education and health combined. Inf infant mortality rates are still really high um, and the numbers of children going to primary school uh, are in the decline, not rising. Um, poverty rates um, have doubled, doubled between 2007 and 2014 and that's estimated to be even worse now after the pandemic. So all of the um, attempts to rescue um, Jamaica through these loans really hasn't led to any progress, but rather has led to, um, you know, more hunger in some ways. Um, uh, nothing, very little improvement. And when, you know, I hadn't been to Jamaica for about 15 years and I expected to see rapid change in tourist areas. Uh, and really I found that there was very little. I was still walking in cracked pavements. There was still um, electricity cutouts. There was still sort of sewage works in some ways kind of going out into the water. So, so um, interviewees talked about how they grew up in poor rural areas, often without water and light, talked about their parents or guardians struggling to put food on the table to clothe them to pay for essential school items or to pay for their travel to school. Uh, often their mothers worked very long hours and commuted um, and the whole household then lived in this economy of makeshifts, trying to hustle a living and children were involved in that as well as adults. So, you know, working on any patch of land that they had, um, going to to work with their parents to some extent, maybe domestic care and agriculture. Um, and many stated that by the time they were five or six, they were working in the household. And by the time they were 12 and 13, they had a really strong sense of wanting to be economically active in some way to make a contribution to those, um, those family networks, either because they loved their parents or because they wanted to get some independence because they wanted to get as far away as possible from their parents or the people that were caring for them. Um, so in this context, I think, um, you know, the IMF really imposed austerity um, and Jamaicans even experience poverty when they are working. So if you think the national min minimum wage is only about 7,000 Jamaican dollars, which isn't very much, I think $35. Uh, so it's, it's far from a living wage. So, and it's incredibly expensive to live there. Um, and there's very little infrastructure for education, health and welfare. Um, and, you know, even there, there isn't even tr transport to get their kids to school, free transport. So all of this means that, you know, that people are, are struggling, really struggling to, to make ends meet. Um, and although in the tip report, um, you know, poverty is frequently mentioned um, and referenced as a factor that can create trafficking and forced labor. labor. What mostly remains unsaid is that this poverty is very much a political creation and that the most obvious policy to reduce it is debt cancellation or, you know, not more foreign aid. Um, and it's crucial as well, I think, to note that poverty also encourages voluntary participation in exploitative forms of labor as well as in sex work. So, um, so what we found really that like the key message that we found is this, that trafficking isn't the problem. So even though, you know, um, the tip report is framing this as the main problem um, uh, and the Home Office in the UK as well is framing, you know, modern trafficking as the main problem, we found that that 
isn't the main problem for the people that we interviewed. Um, uh, and in fact, violence that was experienced by all sex workers um, wasn't because of trafficking, but it was because of the way that trafficking, anti-sex work and anti-gay policies shaped the experience of sex workers. Um, and the experience of black heterosexual and LGBT people in particular point to real problems with how trafficking and modern slavery narratives define the problem that they're trying to tackle. So in terms of adult sex workers violence, um, I'm going to move it along. Um, we found that um, many of the people that we interviewed, they all reported experiencing um, rape, physical violence, extortion, robbery. Um, several female sex workers also experienced confinement and constant surveillance when they were working in brothels because they'd entered into contracts of or kind of sem semi sort of um, uh, indentured, you know, where they go and work somewhere for two weeks, um, had very limited uh, options to go out because they're in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, um, but none of the the women that we interviewed or adults that we interviewed actually said that sex trafficking was something that they had experienced. Um, you know, all of them had made an independent choice to engage in sex work as a way of earning money um, because there were so few low skilled jobs. Um, and those people that were lucky enough to get a job in tourism really um, could, you know, rarely earn more than 10,000 J on a good day, you know, per week. Um, and so the violence that they experienced wasn't used to force them to become sex workers. Rather, it was used because they were, you know, they experienced violence because they were sex workers. Um, and street work in Jamaica is criminalized. Um, soliciting and loitering laws um, are pretty strict uh, in our interviewees. Um, we found that police officers uh, were often uh, one of the perpetrators of physical violence against sex workers, and they also demanded money and would rape them. Um, and male and trans sex workers also experienced this. So uh, sex workers can't experience any form of protection from the police. And street sex workers are also at high risk of violence from members of the public, as well as targets of robbery. So here you've got a graph of, um, from some of the data that we got from the survey and 165 um, sex workers. And, you know, this is like, they exper experience extreme violence and microaggressions from the public, from customers, uh, from the police, and very few really from, you know, in comparison to that, from pimps and, and, uh, and employers. Um, so, so again, the violence wasn't employed to induce them to sell sexual services. So it wasn't trafficker sort of those inflicting violence on them to force them to sell sex. They were quite willing to perform sexual services in the um, commercial sex acts. Rather, it's to force them into non-consensual sex acts. So they, they were victims of rape and battery and not trafficking. Um, so... Um, though crimes of victims of crime, they're also unable to really to go to the police for protection. Um, and in the case of male interviewees um, uh, who were homosexual, they didn't dare report uh, the crimes that were perpetrated against them by the police. Um, and uh, when we interviewed police officers, you know, we saw that they were right um, because uh, you know, they, they basically laughed in our face when we said, oh, um, have you ever um, arrested uh, a client for, for raping a sex worker? And they just said, well, sex workers can't get raped. You know, they were just didn't sort of, you're a public property and they couldn't. So they just didn't um, follow through with any of those um, protections. Um, and in fact, there were real high risks of, of, of being uh, experiencing violence from police officers too. So um, here's uh, some data that we got from the types of uh, um, threats and violence that the sex workers experienced. Um, <clears throat> and often then this meant that interviewees would rather work in a brothel where they had limited um, uh, freedoms than work on the street 
because they were safer in brothels than they were on the streets. And as one interview put it, you can either work in freedom on the streets with, with no safety or, or in safety with, with in clubs with no freedom. And those were the choices that they were kind of faced with. Um, so in short, adults we interviewed who currently worked as sex workers experienced multiple and serious violations of civil labor and human rights on a routine basis. But the solutions that flow from trafficking and modern slavery frames do nothing to address those kinds of violations. And in fact, they might even worsen them, um, you know, and their, and their situation be, because they're adding stigma to sex work um, and allowing the police uh, greater powers to apply um, punitive kind of clampdowns uh, as well as raid clubs, um, all in the name of combating trafficking. Um, <clears throat> I want to move on now to a little bit to, about the LGBTQ sex workers that we kind of interviewed. So um, in all, we interviewed um, eight adult uh, um, male and trans sex workers um, uh, in, in interviews and, and through super, um, focus groups. And all of them started sex work uh, under the age of 18. And they said that they had been reported as missing or even trafficked. So their family had reported them as missing and that this data would have gone on and, and they would have been seen as being somebody who'd been sort of trafficked. Um, so in, um, there was only one case where the interviewee said that they felt they had been manipulated or tricked, but otherwise all the others uh, performed commercial sex acts um, not because they were pushed by a third party pimp or anything, but because of the situation they found themselves in. Um, and often they found themselves um, because they were gay or gender non-conforming as being ostracized from the local community and the families that they live in. They were subject to bullying, serious violence in some cases, thrown out of homes by parents or guardians or, or, or they ran, you know, and so they ran away. So in Jamaica, the bug, bugly, bugly, buggery law of um, 1860 still hasn't been appealed. There are um, people working and campaigning around repealing it, but there's, there's still a way to go. Um, mostly because the government is quite fearful of addressing this law because is, there's quite a lot of um, uh, support for it still. Um, <coughs> so, um, and then when they ran away, they found that they were often, um, often without money or shelter and needed some place to grow up. So quote there saying, you know, that they ran away because of their community and then they found that they were, you know, on the streets and uh, having to find some place, some way to work. So sex work for them became a way of surviving. Um, and our interviewees, you know, reported that often um, along with this, they often found sex were preferable to being looked after by an older adult who would expect constant sexual access. You know, working in the sex industry actually meant that they had a certain level of independence, even as a, um, a, a sort of young teenage person and, and not to be in an oppressive or abusive uh, relationship. Um, um, so lots of them also worked with, in the tourism industry um, and some reported having been raped or assaulted or cheated by tourists. However, their tourist customers were solicited in the same way that their local customers were. So it wasn't exactly the same as a sort of sex tourist sort of encounter. It's more so. Um, so they didn't regard it as a form of sex tourism. So. As with adult sex workers then, the violence that um, these children experienced was really practiced by people that wanted, didn't want to induce them to sell sex, but rather, um, you know, it um, wanted, wanted something from them that they weren't willing to get. So the violent attacks came, came from rates, um, you know, rather than people wanting to force them into sex work. Um, but more, more so there was that, you know, so they had the stigma of being a sex worker, but they also had the stigma attached to homosexuality um, to, to deal with. So that even medical staff, and there, there was one story that one um, interviewee told us about uh, what had happened when he'd been um, raped at the age of 14 and hospitalized. Um, and he had 
gone to the doctor for treatment. The doctor had told him that he had an STD, but didn't really provide him with any treatment or information about the STD. Um, and there was no, no discussion. He didn't sort of see him as a child and, you know, kind of help to protect him or bring in other kinds of social workers or anything, or ask him any questions about his sexual activity or call the police to investigate the crime. Um, so he didn't feel protected in any way because he felt that as a gay child, he wasn't seen as someone who was deserving of care and support, um, uh, the sort of support that might have been extended to a girl child had she been found in that same sort of situation. So for a, a gay or trans child then, um, they're not constructed as sexually innocent or unknowing, and so they're not deserving of the same sorts of protection from the state. So sexuality here really differentiates who can be the victim and, and this kind of then is mapped onto the policy traf policy around trafficking um, and, and on the ground this shapes the type of support then that a child gets from the police or the medical profession, school, social support, welfare systems. So um, the, this interviewee felt very failed by the system that should have protected a child. Um, and so he wouldn't go to the police for protection after that. Um, and in terms of sex tourism as well, um, you know, um, uh, young um, sex workers who were found in tourist, um, tourist hotels, um, were often the ones that were seen as being the criminals rather than the tourists themselves. So they never reported violence to hotel securities because the police would just see them as the criminal and the perpetrators and would be asking them what were they doing in their hotel in the tourist's room rather than seeing the tourist as the perpetrator and the criminal. Um, and there were quite lots of cases of tourists paying off the police as well to get away from uh, you know, being charged. Um, and all the focus on the hotels as well. So even though the hotel industry says that here it has developed the spot, the signs, and is trying to encourage stu um, tourists to um, uh, uh, report abuse that they see, and to know how to identify possible cases of child sex tourism. Um, in reality, um, the security is really about keeping the tourists safe and keeping local people out of the tourism, uh, tourism kind of um, hotels and resorts. Um, and if the tourist accuses them of theft or harassment or of being a sex worker and reported you know, they're more likely to be reported to the police um, and uh, a criminal proceeding will more likely take place. So again, the solutions that flow from the trafficking and modern slavery frame do nothing to address these violations experienced by these interviews, interviewees or to protect other children that kind of have similar experience. And the TIP report then um, doesn't urge um, governments such as Jamaica to decriminalize sex homosexuality or to, um, you know, prosecute and convict those that have committed rape against um, boys and men, as well as women and girls. Um, so, you know, I think that this is kind of a, one of the areas where there's a real blind spot in some of these um, issues. So, so instead of uh, you know, a kind of the way that the trafficking and modern slavery tend to frame these issues as being sex work is something highly dangerous and um, terrible for children to be in. To be in. In fact, we found that uh, a lot of the um, interviewees that were LGBTQ that we interviewed, uh, the sex um, people who are working in this sex work community were really important because they provided them with an alternative family, an alternative source of support and also you know they were recognized, they were acknowledged um, and one quote was that you know that we see each other as family and another explained you know if a bunch of us is living in one house the older one will be the house mother, the other will be the sister, the brother, the cousin, we just have a family, we're a small community, we make it as a family. So instead of seeing as uh, sex work as being something that 
um, made, marginalized them and isolated them, actually it gave them a way of connecting to others that shared their experience and that um, gave them some form of acceptance um, rather than, and they didn't really see the kind of negatives of the sex industry, you know. So, so that we found was uh, it's quite interesting. And I think other people are finding that in their research as well on the LGBTQ community. Um, and so the other message and that came out through clear and clear was this that rape is rape and that, you know, that um, police forces have to acknowledge that uh, sex work is work and that when someone um, doesn't consent to sexual act, um, even if being paid, then that is a form of rape. Um, and that is kind of right across the board for sort of female sex workers and, and male sex workers as well and trans sex workers. The other area that we kind of, I always found really interesting then was looking at heterosexual men in, um, in the sex industry. So I don't know if many of you know Jamaica, but there is um, big thriving, um, I'm going to say lots of women, women are more likely to go to Jamaica to pursue um, commercial sexual encounters than men. Um, and, and this is because the sex industry in Jamaica that caters to men, it's very organized, it's very formal, there's very little informal sex industry where a guy can pretend that he is somebody's girlfriend. Where in, uh, um, but this isn't the case for female tourists who travel to Jamaica, there's a big informal sex industry where women can um, uh, um, you know, be swept away and sweet talked by a guy, and where the fiction of romance kind of uh, uses um, fiction of romance kind of covers the sexual economic exchanges that are taking place, so that they don't women don't have to acknowledge that they're buying sex or that they're entering into a sexual economic exchange. And the men also often don't acknowledge that they are sex workers. So six of the men that were interviewed identified as heterosexual were working um, and, and entering various forms of sexual economic exchanges, but none of them really I self-identified as sex workers which is quite interesting. And um, all of them had run away from home as young teenagers. And um, <coughs> in one case, one would run away from home at the age of 10. And they made their way to tourist areas um, and entered into sexual economic relationships as just one of a, a whole range of strategies um, that were open to them alongside selling trinkets, jewelry, marijuana, um, and the majority of these relationships were with white tourist women. Um, and this is quite interesting in itself because through the lens of trafficking and modern slavery discourses, um, you know, the, the um, women are rarely um, uh, constructed as perpetrators um, and white women in particular are often more often seen as victims of trafficking than perpetrators, um, where the young black men are more likely to be seen as the perpetrators of, of sexual violence than as victims. And I think that these kind of racialized and gendered discourses and essentialized ideas about sexuality really shape some of these kinds of constructions around um, um, sex work. Um, so Jamal, for example, he kind of said, you know, he's a 45 year old who ran away to the beach when he was 13. And I interviewed him about 20 years ago when he was like in his late teens. And um, his narrative, late teens, early 20s, so his narrative then was very different to the one that he has now. So now he doesn't really, you know, he engages now and then in sexual economic exchanges, but it's not the basis of all of his income. Um, and he and it's quite interesting listening to his narrative because you really see the way that race, gender and sexuality kind of intersect and come to the fore in his narrative about his experience. So he describes himself as a very handsome man who was educated on the beach um, and running away was um, one of the key narratives that came through over and over again, you know, that they were running away from uh, not from nice homes, but they were fleeing poverty, abuse and violence. So they saw running away as a form of safety, um, you know, to get away from persecution. 
persecution and poverty. Um, so like slaves, children were running away to seek freedoms that they wouldn't have if they had stayed put. And, and that's the kind of way that they had framed it. Um, and Jamal, for example, he had been unhappy at, um, at home as a child. His parents had split up um, and they lived in poverty. You know, he kind of told me about his father could never give him, um, you know, a note of money. It was always silver coins. Uh, and then his mother migrated to Canada, took the two youngest children and left him in the care of his father, who then um, remarried and, and died but so basically he was on his own and he describes his early life as a runaway an adventure so he was sort of 12 13 when he ran away and for him it was a very positive experience one that afforded him the opportunity to meet other people who were kind to him who helped him out it also um, he was also meeting people who were lighter skinned than him and he saw this as a sign of a higher status you know he was meeting town people and nice people who were kind to him um, um, when he first ran away to Negril he was working pushing carts in the market and then some rastas trained him to uh, tra a trade you know they trained him and taught him a trade to make jewellery trinkets which he still does now cook vegetarian food he learned to swim and snorkel um, later he became a boxer that was run by a, um, a foreigner that had opened a gym to train local kids and they could go for free, but he couldn't feed them. And so at night he decided as he got older to look for tourist women um, and try and hustle some, some money to get some food and survive. Um, so he was really surprised in his narrative and I found it, you know, like how white people constructed him as beautiful. So for the first time in his life, he saw himself as someone of value. You know, he said, the first time I saw white people, I can't believe that that people here, you know, um, he was saying because but he was saying, you know, people saw him as Jamie Foxx, you know, I, you know, in Jamaica, they'd never call me Michael Jordan. And I didn't know I was going to get all of these great titles. God, as soon as I cut my hair, made it shine that I'm Michael Jordan and, and Jamie Foxx. I swear to God, these people pin names on me. So he was just really, you know, he, he was seen as a star for the first time. He couldn't believe that, you know, that these white people were coming to the beach and they, and they could see him as someone that's special. So for him, that experience was a kind of form of social mobility but also um, it gave him uh, a sense of value in himself you know that he was someone that was you know which he'd never had before from his family as well um, and so for him these encounters with white tourists represented opportunities as well to a better life and a better lifestyle. Um, when, when we were talking, we were talking for a few hours, you know, and he was laughing about what he'd told me before when he was younger. And then he said, you know, with hindsight, he does acknowledge now that some of the economic exchanges he had on the beach could be categorized as rape. You know, they were older women. He was under 18 and they didn't perceive him as a child because he was tall um, and, you know, looked like a man. Um, and he didn't really know how to um, just, you know, deal with this, really. He had really ambivalent feelings and biggest feelings about this. But this really highlights how the constructions of perpetrators are so narrow that, and, and what violence is, isn't it, in particular, that you kind of, that, you know, in the, you, it doesn't really capture these kinds of experiences where people are trying to survive. They're entering, it's not all fantastic, but it's not all bad either. Um, um, <clears throat> and this kind of really points then to, I think, a legacy of colonialism and the, and the way that we've developed systems of sexual racism that shape hierarchies in the sex industry. Um, and increasingly, there's more work on this. So people like Angela Jones, who works on how race shapes online sex industry, Kamala Kempadu, who's working on the sex industry in the Caribbean has kind of looked at how, um, you know, the color hierarchy and the pigmentography in the, in the Caribbean has constructed a kind of idea of a natural whore and the dangerous hypersexual man. But all of these also are embedded, unspoken in, in this kind of, uh, uh, in the dominant discourses around trafficking and modern slavery as well. <clears throat> so um, finally then, so in terms of the tourism industry then, um, <clears throat> When we looked and talked, so when we talked to people who are working in the tourism industry, 
um, we found that a lot of them experienced sexual harassment um, through their employment in tourism, uh, both by tourists and by supervisors and managers. Um, and again, the dominant discourses on trafficking and modern slavery, and especially on sex tourism, doesn't sort of talk about this kind of angle of, of sexual exploitation, that people are working in very poorly paid um, jobs um, and <coughs> And, uh, and then have very little power over the types of relationships and authorities, you know, that they have. So, and that makes them very vulnerable to sexual violence and exploitation from their employers and from the tourists that they're working with. And so there's plenty of evidence to suggest that there's this false assumption somehow that um, sexual exploitation and violence um, doesn't occur within the tourism industry. It does. And although the TIP report calls on governments to report measures it takes to identify and persecute traffickers, um, it often doesn't look at the big owned foreign tourism businesses that are, you know, not required to take measures to identify and root out um, tourists who have sexually harassed or exploited staff or the way that managers lack, don't, you know, protect their staff uh, and might actually sexually harass them as well. And I think this is a kind of a, another angle where there's this thing where if you're working, that's good. You're not likely to experience sexual harassment or sexual violence. But if you're in the sex industry, you know, that is that is bad. And you will, you know, they, there's kind of these dichotomies that are really um, very poor. So if I can go now. So I just want to conclude then. So I think there's a real kind of... Um, some of the distinctions then that are made um, by trafficking discourse and modern slavery discourse really kind of linked to these very oversimplistic binaries that don't really help us capture what's going on or to think about real solutions. Um, so none of the people that we interviewed, very few of them, really, well, yeah, only one really was controlled by any third party actor. Um, and they didn't get involved in sex work because they were pushed by third party actors then. Um, yet many of the NGOs uh, in Jamaica, such as Shared Hope International, which is a, a Christian NGO, which is funded by an American Christian organization, suggests that this is happening to uh, on a huge range. And this, this course really overlooks the reality of the supply side. So our interviews weren't enticed away from happy childhoods into a hopeless life of abuse and violence in the sex industry. And they really challenged this kind of stereotype um, and assumptions around anti-trafficking and modern slavery. You know, um, for them, uh, sex work wasn't a form of enslavement, but actually allowed them certain freedoms that uh, enable them to escape unhappy homes, to stay alive, to sometimes make some money. Often as they got older, they were able to travel as well um, and do a whole range of different things. Um, and so home for them wasn't some place where they were you know, nourished and cared for. So this distinction that's often made, I think, um, uh, doesn't really help us to kind of think about what's actually going on. Um, and these narratives then really tell us about the sort of messy and complicated mix then of global parallelations that are um, not just gendered, but also racialized and sexualized and, you know, socioeconomic as well. Um, and, and kind of to help us think about, well, what actually counts as sexual violence for the victims as well as the perpetrators and the way that discourses of child sex tourism are often uh, essentialized in lots of different ways and that this is can be quite problematic. Um, <clears throat> so for us then, I think overall our participants felt that they had a lot of agency in making the choices about not living in poverty um, and moving uh, and constructing their own identities. Um, and yet the anti-trafficking uh, policy really demonized those who turn to sex work. And I think this perhaps is the real form of sexual violence that we have to sort of try and think about how we unpick going into the future. And I think I'll end it there. <laughs>
No, I have one more. So I'll just, I've got one more slide. So I think, yeah, so these were their key recommendations, actually, you know, from the people that we interviewed. Um, really, they wanted the decriminalization of sex work for all adults uh, and repealing all laws that would uh, criminalize the purchase and organization of sex work um, and the decriminalization of homosexuality as well. That was like seen as key, two key things that were really important. Um, uh, as well as training some police officers, and I'd go for that as well. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave it there and uh, you can... Thank, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, really, thank you so much. And this is, uh, yeah, really fabulous to see lots of applauses coming in. So this is great. So we have about 12 minutes uh, where we can open this up for questions. Um, so again, you can please feel free to use the chat, um, or if you want, you can raise your hand. Um, and let's see if there's, if anyone wants to start off with a question. Oh yeah, okay, so I see Sean. So Sean, yeah, if you're okay to unmute yourself. Thank you, I couldn't find the raise hand function. I'm having some tech problems. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, one of the, I, I have a question that's a little bit outside of the box here, but I'm just curious whether or not in the interviews, uh, participants talked about um, social networks or, or networks amongst each other. So did your, um, did sex workers talk about, you know, mobilizing resources between other sex workers, sharing information about places that were safe and places that weren't safe? Was there, um, yeah, I, I, so maybe a little bit, um, if you could discuss that, was there anything um, that came out in the interviews uh, about um, resource mobilization between sex workers in Jamaica? Um, yes, they were a very collegiate bunch, really, and often really um, supporting each other, you know, so they, if they were working in, um, if they had, to go and see a client in a tourist hotel, for example, they would let somebody else know where they were. Often, you know, they would share clothes. Um, they would, you know, so that you could always look good. Um, they would cover each other's excuses. So if they had, I don't know, you know, but in the formal industry, often, you know, they might be with a client maybe for a week. I mean, that's ideally the best, you know, sort of contract that you can get is a long term one where you you pick somebody up at the airport and then you drop them off and you're with them. You might get two clients coming in at the same time, and you might need to juggle those two clients, and so they'd, you know, help each other out there as well supporting themselves you know so in lots of different ways so from uh, you know sharing accommodation um, telling them safe places to work advising them about you know where to get condoms or different types of approaches that they could use you know I felt that they were very sort of put supportive mm -hmm. um, and that's among um, so you've got your your men on the beach as well and then the LGBT community and sex workers Do um, they interact did the LGBTQ um, sex workers interact with the, you know, cis straight sex workers? Through Swatch, there is some interaction. Um, and and I think people get a lot of information through, so Swagism and Sex Workers Association of Jamaica. And so they do have, uh, you know, they try and bring everybody together. Um, I, but then otherwise, I think you have pockets of people, you know, so um, maybe groups of people really that kind of support each other. Um, and, uh, but um, Sugar, for example, there was one quote that I had from um, a student and that is, so she was saying how, so she was a trans woman, she was saying how she was um, adopted by a female sex worker and kind of lived with her for three or four years and she didn't push her into sex work, but she told her the rules and the guidelines and she told her, you know, kind of what to do. And for Sugar, that was something that just gave her the options, you know, didn't push her into it, but she was allowed to earn some money to get an education to continue her studies which is what she really wanted to do so there was a lot of crossover in terms of, of and I think those were sort of some of the really important things I think that a lot of the um, female sex workers knew that um, young gay and LGBT people that were on the street were on the street because they were gay and they tended to be much more open I think and supportive yeah but I'm not saying that everyone was like that but the ones I interviewed tended to be yeah there's a lot of crossover and support there but an area that you could probably do a lot more research on. 
I think. Great. Any any other question? Okay, yeah, Brayden, I see has his hand up. Um, yeah, one um, narrative that I kind of saw emerge at a couple places, um, both with the example of the um, one sex worker that you talked about where he was saying, where he dealt a lot with older women that were, like didn't really see him as a child because he was tall, and with the one sex worker who was assaulted and hospitalized is kind of like the denials of like the privilege of like youth and childhood um, and kind of just like the viewing of like these children as like adults due to like their social position. Um, was this a narrative that came out more in your interviews or am I just kind of reading into this? Um, it comes out more in the interviews that I've done with sex tourists and with, um, you know, that, uh, yeah. And I think with the younger, because I've interviewed a lot of sex tourists as well. So in terms of, of um, the people that we interviewed this time, yeah, they mostly felt that they weren't being seen as adults. Um, they, you know, they were seen as people who were sexual and that was like the key thing. But in terms of sex tourists and I, you know, like the research I did quite a few years ago now, um, they used very racializing discourses to say these children are different. They're not like children at home. You know, they mature younger, they're, they're in these countries where they see sex everywhere and they have this kind of very racializing discourses. And, and one of the questions that we asked on, um, uh, in the survey on, on with tourists, which is something we did years ago as well, we asked them, you know, whether they could identify a child of 15, make a dis distinguish a child between 15 in Jamaica and a child that was 15 in in um, in Canada, say, in their home country, and. Uh, Surprisingly, lots of them said they wouldn't be able to identify a 15 year old in Jamaica, but they would be able to identify a 15 year old at home. So they didn't feel confident to identify a child in Jamaica. Um, they could, they didn't know the cues, they, they weren't sure, they, you know, um, and, and I think that, that was quite interesting, actually, and I was sort of trying to write that up as well. <laughs> yeah, that there are these distinctions that they kind of, you know, read the children in the countries that they visit as being very different. That's great. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Uh, okay, so Brian, I see, has a question. Yes, Hi, I do. Uh, thank Thank you very much for your presentation. It was interesting to get the um, uh, inputs, ideas of the uh, sex workers. Um, have they run into, from the ones you spoke to, have they run into the anti-trafficking people? I'm thinking of, uh, for example, some of the NGOs who swoop in, um, kind of like saviors of these poor defenseless children um, to uh, rescue them and therefore uh, make a big, uh, what would you say, big publicity about the, uh, the saving work that they are doing. Um, does that enter into the, uh, the local scene in Jamaica, for example? Yes, it does. Um, like Shared Hope International, which is one that I mentioned, is quite an important one. And their data actually feeds into the TIP report. Um, and, and Jamaica is a very, Christian country. There are more churches in Jamaica than there are bars, I think. There's like a church at every other corner. <laughs> and, um, and it's a incredibly religious sort of, uh, and so even though people don't practice, I think they, they're still still there you know it's still there um and and they're very powerful i think this is one of the reasons why they haven't been able to decriminalize um uh homosexuality yet because they're still quite a strong force and they're quite conservative um and um like swaj is has very little dealing they try and have very little dealings with them i, I don't think they really go out into the field and try and recruit sex workers um as such, if that's what you're thinking that they're doing. No, they, they try and, um, but they do uh, work with orphanages. Um, you know, if uh, the police maybe get a runaway, they might be involved uh, a little bit, but they're not, they haven't really got the resources to do very much, actually, I think. I think that's the kind of issue they're not, they're not 
the money they're getting is from the US and they're only getting money if they say they're doing something on trafficking, anti-trafficking, in which case they might be going out. Um, there's a few um, resources. We went to a few places where they, a Christian organization has set up an a education establishment where they're teaching teenagers how to prepare themselves for the tourist industry. Um, so that's like, and, and it's quite interesting going into these schools, which are just, you know, like one room schools in a small, small place. And you see the posters on the front and, and, and all of that really is about grooming. Make sure you're well groomed. Make sure your shirt is ironed and clean. Make sure you say yes, please. And thank you. And, and it seems very basic. So they're not, they're not really helping them to get, you know, excellent jobs or an, an education but about um, finding low skilled jobs in the tourism industry and supplying that kind of work but yeah so they don't really have very and the sex workers that I talked to didn't really have any any um, encounters with Christian organizations trying to get them out of sex work I think that's probably more it's more organized in places like Thailand China, few um, Nigeria, few a few countries where it's quite organised, but not so much in Jamaica. No, no, I've seen that on YouTube. There are many videos of the uh, the dramatic work being done by the uh, the foreign NGOs. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, there's a big critique around that now as well. So, so Judo O'Connell Davidson's written about it. Um, Elena Shi as well has done quite a lot of work on Thailand and critiquing those kinds of. And um, Sam um, uh, Sam O'Keary on in Ghana actually has done quite some interesting work around that as well. Thanks for that. Thank All right, you. so we're we're coming up to the end of time. So I see there's two more people with questions. So can I take Lynn and Sean, both of your questions together? And then we'll see if yeah, Jackie can uh, answer them in the time. So maybe um, Lynn, do you want to go first? And then Sean. Hi, Lynn. And then Jackie, yeah, answer them together. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> I, <forget. laughs> I was just wondering, because you're finding that the female tourists uh, don't view themselves as in a economic exchange. They're kind of caught up in this whirlwind romance. Um, so I was wondering if these relationships start online and then they specifically travel to Jamaica in order to meet uh, the males that they're start this romance with. Okay. And, and Sean, do you want to ask your question? Uh, thank you. So um, my question was about the ultimate form of violence being murder. And so I was just curious about, um, you know, you, a lot of the stories you talked about, you, the, the police were fairly uh, ambivalent um, about the, you know, the, the assaults that um, um, sex workers were experiencing. And so I was wondering if there were any discussions about, you know, murder the, uh, amongst the sex workers. Is this a, is this a problem in, in Jamaica? Um, and, and yeah, that was my question. Sorry, I'm not the most articulate today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll answer the first one. Um, I think now online um, has permeated the sex industry and I think they, there are some people that are using the online as a way of, of meeting people, but they're still very limited. Like none of the sex workers I talked to had a computer or had a laptop, or you know, had access. You know, you have access to a phone, but they have no. They don't have access to a phone, so they have to go to, um, you know, a telephone place to make a phone call to their girlfriends to tell them to send them money, or their boyfriends. You know, they. So there's no. There's, the technology isn't there yet. You know, you're lucky to find a sex worker with a smartphone. Um, so I think that's still on the back burner. But I know there are websites with. Um, nice young Jamaican men, you know, looking for potential partners and wives. And I think that is one way, but you have to be pretty affluent to be able to afford that in the first place. So I think it's probably the more affluent sort of Jamaican guys that might be doing that. But if they were affluent, then they probably wouldn't necessarily um, want to do that unless they really wanted to find a way to migrate. And I think that's one of the reasons that is kind of, you know, pushing them to sort of use that then. Um, and the females, so most female sex tourists, they go there 
knowing what a lot knowing what's going on so, you know knowing that they can find a part-time boyfriend for a holiday fling um and they go there and find someone when they're there or they've been once before so a lot of the people that we interviewed or surveyed for example I did a survey years ago a lot of them were repeat visitors so they were kind of veterans you know so they would go there once figure out what was going on and then realize, oh, okay, I can come back again. And then maybe they would get somebody, a, a particular guy that they liked, who would become their the guy that they would pick them up at the airport that they spend, you know, a few days a week with and two weeks, and then they would drop them off. Uh, and then, or, you know, they might be with them and then they might get bored with them and say, well, I'm going and I'm going to befriend somebody else now for a while, you know, so they had a lot of power and leeway. So a bit, like that but um i think um online it's starting but a lot of a lot of uh, local jamaicans just don't have the technology or the money for it and there's the infrastructure still pretty poor for that um and sean sorry lastly last one yes murder is a big problem um, there have been a number of trans uh, women murdered on the beach um and they're very fearful this community is really fearful for their lives really yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry that we have to end it there, but um, just on behalf of the department, I just want to thank Jackie again so much for your time. Such an interesting talk. I have lots of questions, you know, would have loved to ask. I'm sure Jackie uh, maybe wouldn't mind if anyone wants to have follow-up conversations, uh, can share contact details, but yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, and just a, a a quick plug as well, um, our next sociology colloquium speaker is uh, Jinjira Yaharan, who's from Bowling Green State University, and that's the 29th, 29th of October, and we hope to see you then. But Jackie, thank you again very, very much, and everyone enjoy the rest of your Friday and your weekend, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you, everyone, for interesting questions. Nice meeting you all. Bye. Have a good weekend.